Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to each of the witnesses that are here today. Every responsible gun owner knows that safely score storing their firearms is critical. Heidi and I store our firearms safely, uh, and we expect that everyone with a fire firearm in their home should do the same. We also know that when firearms are not stored responsibly, there can be tragic consequences. Senator Blumenthal spoke about Ethan Song, a 15-year-old boy who fatally shot himself by accident with a firearm that was stored at a friend's house. For all of us, our hearts goes out to the entire family. And Ms. Song, thank you for being here. Thank you for telling your son's story. As a parent, what you experienced is a nightmare that, that terrifies every parent. All of us want to avoid tragedies like that happening in the future. At the same time, firearms in the home can be critical for defending the home, can be critical for defending members of the family from violent crime. One example of that that we will hear from today occurred on November 5th, 2017, when a vicious murderer walked into the sanctuary at Sutherland Springs First Baptist Church in Texas and started shooting innocent churchgoers. Stephen Williford, who I've since gotten to know quite well and who will be a witness today. Mr. Williford was a neighbor just down the street and he heard the shots. And he went and got his weapon, which is an AR-15, and he ran down the street and engaged with the shooter. And his heroism saved life, lives that day. His heroism was extraordinary. I can tell you I was in that sanctuary the day after that shooting, and it remains one of the most horrific things I have ever seen to stand in that beautiful church where a deranged madman committed an act of unspeakable evil. Mr. Williford's weapon was secured in a gun safe, and the time it took for him to remove it from the gun safe slowed down his response time. And one of the challenges that we all face is a slowed down response time in an instance like that can mean the difference between people living and people dying. All across the country, people rely on quick access to firearms in their homes to defend themselves. A 2013 report ordered by the Obama administration's CDC stated that, quote, almost all national survey estimates indicate that defensive gun uses by victims are at least as common as offensive uses by criminals, with estimates of annual uses ranging from 500,000 to more than three million. We're not talking about one or two or a handful. This is the Obama administration estimating defensive uses of firearms. In other words, firearms used to prevent a crime occur somewhere between 500,000 and three million times a year. If our objective is to save lives, and I believe all of us want to save lives, ensuring that people can effectively access their firearms to defend themselves and their families is critically important. And sometimes the defensive use includes children defending themselves and defending their families. For example, earlier this year, a 12-year-old boy in Goldsboro, North Carolina, shot two masked intruders, killing one of them after they forcefully entered his home and shot the boy's grandmother. In 2018, a 15-year-old girl who was also from North Carolina and who had been trained on how to shoot and safely handle firearms, grabbed a gun hidden in her house for protection and shot her mother's abusive boyfriend after he had attacked her mother and threatened to kill her. If the firearms that these minors had used to defend themselves and their families had been inaccessible, the consequences could very well have been devastating. So 
So when we talk about safe storage, we have to keep in mind that restricting quick and ready access to a firearm potentially comes at a serious cost to people's lives. We should be encouraging people to make responsible choices that balance the risk of accidents with the need for self-defense. And that's exactly what many of the voluntary programs across the country have been doing. For example, Project Child Safe, run by the National Shooting Sports Foundation, provides ch gun locks free of charge. And I will tell you this is an issue on which there can be bipartisan cooperation. When it comes to Project Ch Child Safe, it so happens that I have a very personal history with that project. Because in the years 1999 and 2000, I was a policy staffer working on the George W. Bush uh, presidential campaign. And as a policy staffer responsible for domestic policy, I was the 28, 29 year old staffer who designed the very first Project Child Safe and drafted the briefing paper and presented it to then Governor Bush. And Governor Bush agreed and campaigned for president in 2000 on Project Ch Child Safe, on providing gun locks free of charge to the millions of Americans who don't have gun locks so that they can better protect themselves, their families, their children, the friends of their children. And that project ended up being announced, campaigned upon, and when George W. Bush was elected, implemented. Uh, and today, Mr. Bartosi works very directly with it, and I have to say it, it is encouraging now the millions of child locks that have been given out that came from an idea a 29-year-old kid had sitting in a cubicle uh, that has since been implemented. Critical to that is that it is voluntary, that it is providing child locks so you have the equipment free of charge so that cost is not a barrier to being able to, to lock a firearm, but it is not mandatory. And I believe people can and should make a judgment about what the needs of their home, of their neighborhood, of protecting their family are. The bill that's